So I want to tell you a little bit what I like about STN and where I see like algorithmic opportunities and also uh, interesting new questions because for me it's really posing a lot of fundamental classical questions but with a new kind of twist. And I will give you some examples. In this talk I will mostly focus on consistent network updates which has received a lot of attention recently and there will be another talk later by Klaus and uh, there will actually be one more talk in the afternoon. Um, I'll give you a little bit of an overview uh, of this problem. So mostly I've been working with this with students in Berlin. Got a large set of uh, very smart students. Um, so initially when I started to uh, hear about the SDN, I really thought, okay, I, I see all the algorithmic problems that come up in the application. What I was not so much aware is that there are also quite interesting uh, algorithmic problems related to the control plane and actually also to the data plane. You say, okay, no. In the SDN network, the data plane is becoming simpler, right? So what are the algorithmic problems coming up in the data plane? And actually, there's also quite interesting algorithmic problems coming up due to the decoupling of the data plane and the control plane. So this is one of the fundamental kind of ingredients to SDN, one of the fundamental principles. And um, I will show a couple of examples now. So in, in general, maybe as a general remark, for me, SDN is really about flexibilities, uh, like you can match packets on the layer 2 header, the layer 3 header, layer 4 header. You can do active, proactive flow installation, reactive flow installation. You can do it centrally, you can do it distributedly, the, the control plane and so on. So you have a lot of flexibilities. At the same time, you also have constraints because the open flow switches, they're still quite simple devices. They cannot run a Turing machine there. They cannot participate in a self-stabilizing protocol. Uh, maybe they're not even a state machine. I think there will be a talk this afternoon uh, going a bit into the, in this direction. Um, and also, of course, exploiting these flexibilities that SDN gives you, you have to be careful not to shoot in your foot, right? You have to be careful to exploit them um, in a safe manner. So my talk will be mostly about um, this interconnecting network, the challenges arising uh, due to this decoupling. Um, I want to give you, nevertheless, a couple of, I think, very interesting questions that I believe uh, are interesting from an algorithmic perspective and also to some extent novel. First one, first application, standard application is routing. Uh, of course, um, a lot of work has been done in circuit routing, on call admission control. There is work by Raghavan, Wolsey, Averbuch. There are people in the audience that work on this. I think Anja Feldman, uh, she was also working on online call admission uh, some, some years ago. Um, I think with the SDN twist here, the new uh, view of SDN introduced here is regarding the flexibilities that you have with respect to the path definition. So in SDN, paths are no longer necessarily shortest paths, but as also in the introduction this morning it was actually mentioned, um, you can do this combination of SDN and NFV. So you have certain middle boxes, certain functions in the network, and you can steer the traffic through these middle boxes and basically create more complex uh, network services. So this is, uh, in Europe, they call these service chains. And I think this afternoon, um, Moti Medina will actually give a talk about this topic, so stay tuned on this, on the online perspective. From the offline perspective, if you start to embed these kind of uh, network flows that traverse uh, multiple segments, it's actually becoming a little bit different than just having like a routing algorithm for each segment itself, right? From the source to the first middle box, you can then go from the first middle box to the second middle box and so on and just stitch it together. Uh, it's a little bit more complicated than that because first of all, um, such a path consisting of multiple segments, you need to either accept all of these segments at once or you have to reject all of them because they constitute a single request. Second, of course, you want to make the joint optimizations of these paths that are no longer simple paths but they can also include loops. And if you go for an approach like uh, LP relaxation and randomized rounding, as people have been doing, for example, Raghavan initiated this, this literature, um, it's actually not so easy anymore to decompose uh, the request into like linear parts. And already, uh, for example, formulating, uh, if, you, if you have this standard ILP, ILP formulation, integer linear program formulation, and you want to um, decompose it, uh, you, you can see that if, if the request is becoming more complex, the relaxed solutions no longer necessarily are simple linear combinations uh, of the elementary solutions. So these are kind of the, the challenges that are introduced there that I find quite interesting. And I, I know that for some of you this is probably quite uh, simple things, but actually we managed now as well to, to do this uh, randomized rounding. Uh, but there is much more that has to be done in, in this area. 
Um, there is also this optional NFV twist, as I call it, that you can deploy these middle boxes also. Um, it's not given locations that you need to interconnect with this service chain, but you can also deploy this uh, network functions yourself. And this is kind of related to classical problems like facility location. You want to place certain facilities that serve the different users. There is also the capacitated dominating set problems, but here it's still a little bit different because you don't care so much maybe about the distance to this uh, middle box or network function, but more like what is the really the length from the start via this middle box to the end node. And um, for example, you want to have a certain stretch, maximum stretch that the path should have via these middle boxes in total. So this is uh, quite um, a little bit different there as well. It's more like about the relay routing rather than routing to the facility. Also, sometimes it's maybe undesirable that uh, when new requests come in and the network grows and, and more communication requests come up, that you kind of migrate the middle box or the, the network function on each of these occasions. But rather, what you often want to have is something like incremental deployment. So that the set of middle boxes that are already deployed, they should be there. And if new traffic comes, maybe you can just reuse them or add an additional middle box somewhere, but not move all these requests around. And this again is related to classical capacitated set cover problems and actually scheduling like Lisa Fleischer has been doing and, and also the color uh, paper on, on the scheduling. So I think this is again quite interesting, the connection, but again here you, I think I would argue you care more about the end-to-end -end latency and not so much about the, the, the distance to these middle boxes. So overall when I, when I read papers, most of uh, the, the literature I know of so far they either have some exponential time in the worst case algorithm, like they formulate the integer linear program, um, and then the alternative is they have a heuristic, so they say, okay, this is anyway a very hard problem. I think it's kind of interesting that people have not looked so much. We started it a little bit, and I think uh, Moti and Medina as well, to go into approximation algorithms of, of these, these problems, and I think it's quite an interesting space. And oftentimes, even if the problem is NP hard, and actually sometimes, uh, it's actually not NP hard if you have something like a closed topology or, or a very sparse graph. Some of these problems are not as hard as, as they are in the general case, uh, for example. So I think it's worth looking a little bit uh, into this literature and also, for example, apply, applying primal dual approximations or in an online setting, online primal dual kind of uh, frameworks can be applied to, the, to this setting. Um, so another uh, on the control plane, I see another um, interesting challenge, actually, this, uh, as has also been mentioned this morning, so that the SDN network, it will scale out, it will become larger uh, over time. And if you want to have like a, an available and, and efficient control plane, you, may, you need to make it distributed. And um, this, this problem of what kind of events can you actually handle locally, what kind of functions can you compute locally, what kind of functions do you need to have a global network state, um, it's very related to classical problems in distributed computing. And there is this so-called local model that has been studied uh, quite a lot in the literature. And this model is kind of um, suited, well suited for ad hoc networks where you have to kind of uh, explore the topology in the beginning, you have to explore your neighbors. In an SDN network, I would say topological events are much less frequent than um, flow events. And basically you can do pre-computation. And it's known that in the local model, if you can do pre-computation, you can do a lot of uh, algorithms more efficiently and relevant, uh, algorithms like load balancing and matching. Um, of, of course, if you have like a distributed control plane, um, it's also kind of related to classical concepts like um, replicated state machine, software transactional memory. You can see the state of the switches as kind of the configuration space. You can see it as a shared memory. And the policies you can see as transactions happening on that uh, kind of uh, state. However, there is also an SDN twist here because the, the transactions, the flows are actually um, real traffic flows and these flows have to be handled in real time and you cannot abort a transaction that is actually a traffic transaction but you want to serve them in any case. And actually flows, network flows, they're not only reading the configuration state, they're not only reading the forwarding rules at the switch, but sometimes they also have side effects. For example, they increase a counter, and of course they change the, the shared memory as well. So it's not as simple, uh, these flows, as, as just read kind of transactions. 
Um, maybe one remark here as well. Sometimes if you have multiple controllers interacting with the switch, um, you can say, okay, if, if this controller is in charge of this flow space of this range of IP addresses and this controller is in charge of this IP range addresses, and if these sets are kind of not intersecting, they're kind of independent, uh, it doesn't really mean that the controllers uh, don't depend on each other nevertheless, because underlying uh, the network, the flows are actually sharing the physical links. And if you basically um, are not careful and map even independently, seemingly independent flows on the same link, um, what can happen is that the load eventually will actually increase. So there are dependencies that are quite subtle and that are not visible simply in the logical spa space of the, of the prefixes, for example, of the header space. Um, one last remark before I go into this interconnection between control plane and, and data plane challenges. Uh, I mentioned that uh, there are also interesting algorithms related to the data plane itself. And now you can say, okay, data plane, uh, what is the data plane doing? So one, um, I think, agreement there is that the data plane should be um, responsible for making fast failover. So if you have a link failure, you don't want to wait for the controller to actually respond to this link failure because maybe the controller is in the cloud or it's not, not reachable. So there should be some mechanisms that do the failover quickly and in the switch itself in band. And what OpenFlow provides you with is like statically pre-configured uh, tables that take effect, rules that take effect once uh, certain links go down. So basically the, the switches are capable of doing the rerouting, the local rerouting without actually interacting with the controller. And this is kind of becoming an interesting algorithmic problem as well, because <clears throat> how can you pre-configure this rule on the switches without really knowing all the failures that happen? And how can I ensure connectivity between endpoints, uh, again, with this completely local view, completely static installed tables? And if you can do tagging of packets in the, in the rule, sometimes you can do packet tagging, it turns out you can tolerate quite a lot of, of failures uh, at the same time. Um, if you cannot do uh, packet tagging, then it's becoming a combinatorial <coughs> problem. And still there are solutions, but it's kind of a quite interesting algorithmic problem as well. Okay, so what I want to talk about more uh, today is these this challenges arising from the interconnection between controller and, and data plane. And here I show you a plot of some of the variants uh, of the update times that happen uh, that occur when the controller installs uh, rules on the OpenFlow switches, on the SDN switches. And you see that the, the, the time until these uh, rules take effect has a certain variance. It's not completely immediate and it's also not always the same. It's not always constant. And this introduces some, again, challenges. Um, and by the way, these this, um, differences here are not only because of the transmission time over the network, but also because of the data structures that different switches take different time uh, of course, to, to update these rules, and sometimes, the, um, of course, it's also very much hardware dependent and, and data structure dependent. So what can go wrong? I show you one of these examples here. So assume you have this um, network here on the left consisting of untrusted hosts, and then you have a, a network of trusted hosts. And initially, you have this path uh, going from along the, the black uh, path, basically, through the firewall, so all the packets that are actually entering the trusted hosts area will first go through this firewall. And now if you want to update this to this dashed blue path um, via the controller, you want to update these rules on that switch uh, in order to, to install this new path, which again uh, perfectly goes through this firewall. So all the packets in principle according to the blue path would also go through this firewall before really entering the trusted zone. Um, if you have now this asynchronous uh, network between the controller and the switches, what can happen is that, for example, this rule takes effect first. Okay, so this rule on the left takes effect first. So what happens now to the packet is that from here, they go directly to the switch, they bypass the firewall and go to the secure host zone, which is not really desired. So although the initial configuration and the final configuration both maintain this waypoint enforcing invariant. Uh, intermediately, if this flow takes effect first, then uh, packets will bypass this. Uh. On the other hand, if, for example, this uh, rule takes effect first, what happens then is you have a transient loop. So the packets exiting the firewall, they basically end up for a short time in this loop there, um, which is also undesirable. 
So these are like transient inconsistency properties that you don't want to have uh, necessarily in, in these kind of networks. So initially, the, the early works in, in this area, it was also uh, Wrightblatt and Nate, in these abstractions for network update, what they proposed is some kind of two-phase commit protocol where you have uh, two paths, so you want to change the, the red path to the blue path, and the approach they're um, doing there is the um, so-called per-packet consistency approach. They say, okay, um, if I want to install the new blue path, first I will update and add these blue rules in the internal switches um, before doing anything to the packets. And once this, these rules have taken effect, I will change at the ingress port. I will all packets that arrive at the ingress port, I will mark them with the blue tag. And accordingly, after this, this flip has been made on the ingress port, the packets will follow this blue path. So um, the, the tagging approach here, it comes at certain costs. So first of all, you need to have a header space for the tagging. Uh, you have a certain overhead, maybe, of, of performing this, this tagging. Um, you also have to have twice as many rules, for example, here at the switch there. And um, sometimes the links will also become available quite late. So um, more recently, there has been proposals for making the network update more uh, less consistent, but to some extent faster and, and uh, at less cost. And this has uh, been introduced in, in a Hotnets paper 2013 by Ratul and and what in Hoffman it's called the, the kind of a weaker transient consistency property. So there, uh, in this weaker transient consistency property, they say, okay, packets don't necessarily have to go either only along the old path or only along the new path, but you allow a certain mix of the, of the paths as long as the packets, during the update, they fulfill certain invariants. For example, they don't go through a loop or they for sure always um, visit uh, the waypoints. So how this um, is performed in, the, in, this, in this model that the controller goes through multiple rounds. It first updates a subset of the switches um, with the new rules. Then it waits for acknowledgments of these rules. And once the, the switches have acknowledged the implementation of, this, of these rules, they go into the second round. And he updates a second subset of these switches. So how does it work now? If you want to implement a loop-free network update in this kind of model, where you don't have tagging, but you have these multiple rounds, you could, for example, update the first two switches in the first round. And once these um, updates have been acknowledged, then uh, you update the third switch uh, in the second round. Um, this, indeed, is like a loop-free update schedule, because um, the, the packets on the backward edge, um, they already know that the forward edge has been implemented. So here the packets cannot loop because I already know in the first round I have updated this rule. <coughs> However, this uh, schedule here has the problem that, of course, is not waypoint enforcing. So here is in the, in the first round, it can happen that this rule takes effect first and then the packets will bypass the firewall, which is undesirable. So what you could do alternatively, you want to implement waypoint enforcing. Uh, network updates, you can say, okay, then in the first round I will update the second and the third switch, and then in the second round I will update the first switch. In this case, of course, it's waypoint enforcing because the, the edge bypassing the waypoint has, uh, is sure that the backward edge has already been installed. Uh, the problem here, of course, is that if this rule here takes effect first on the, on the third switch, you end up in a temporary loop, which is also undesirable. So the first schedule implements loop freedom. This schedule implements uh, waypoint enforcement. But um, the joint criteria um, actually can only be achieved, in this case, with the free round schedule, where in the first round, you will update the, the link out of the, of the waypoint. In the second round, you can then update the third switch. And in the, in the third round, you can update uh, the first switch. So is this model clear of these of this network updates? OK. OK, now um, let's consider this example here. Uh, what do you want to uh, do here is, again, you want to update the network in multiple rounds so that uh, loop freedom and waypoint enforcement is ensured. Uh, do you have an idea how you can actually uh, schedule the network updates according to this model to make this uh, network update correct?
So what can you do in the first round? So in the first round, you can say, okay, let's try to, to update one of the forwarding edges, or maybe f uh, both of them. <laughs> so one of those two blue forwarding edges, either of them is actually bypassing the firewall, so it's not safe to include those forwarding edges in the first round of update. So what about the backward edges? Well, the backward edges in the first round is, is anyway a bad idea because they could happen first and then again you have a loop. So you see this, this is kind of an example that shows you that it's sometimes impossible to update in the, within this model uh, they, are, they have proposed uh, the network in a consistent way where both the waypoint enforcement and the loop freedom is um, actually enforced. So what about this example here? I walk you through because uh, this is a bit uh, complex one, but I will show you in a second why I'm actually proposing this. So here, uh, a feasible schedule exists. I can update this edge first because it will uh, not introduce a loop. Obviously, it's also not bypassing the firewall, so that's, that's fine. And then, um, in the second round, I could, for example, update this um, switch here. So now it's fine to go back uh, to the firewall because the, the first edge has already taken effect. So I'm sure that the packet will not end up in a loop because I already found this exit link out of the loop. Now in the third round, I can update this. It's a bypassing edge, so it bypasses the middle box, but I already installed the second edge that goes back to the firewall. So again, I'm on the same safe side. I can update this link. In the fourth round, I could do this updates. I can in parallel update these two edges. And finally, um, in, the, in, the, in the last round, in the fifth round, it's not maybe an optimal schedule, but it's at least a feasible one. I see that um, I can update this, uh, this network consistently in five rounds. So now recall in the beginning that um, in this schedule, we started with this single link here. But of course, we could also, in addition, um, update this uh, link uh, concurrently. It's also a forwarding edge. It doesn't bypass the firewall. So it's completely safe to update both of these edges. But now the problem is, once you updated these two edges in the first round, um, what can you do next? And you see that um, it's like a deadlock, a dead end, because now you cannot update any forwarding edges, because the forwarding edges, they will, in the second round, they bypass the firewall. You can also not update, it's the same situation as we had before. I cannot update any of the backward edges, because then I will actually end up in the loop. So the, the initial question here, and this is actually what um, leads us to the gadget of the NP-hardness proof, is that um, in the beginning I, I cannot know whether I should actually update this link only, or in addition I can also safely update the next uh, link on top. So here we see an example that um, in order to enforce loop freedom and waypoint enforcement, uh, the problem can become NP-hard already to decide whether it's actually possible, not, not minimizing the number of rounds. So it's not that we can make a quick test and say, okay, this, uh, this instance is not, not feasible, so we should go back, for example, to the per packet consistent update with the, with the tagging, but it's not even feasible in polynomial time to, to check whether um, actually a solution exists. Okay, so um, we are currently, um, in this case, of course this is a very special graph and nobody of us has probably seen such kind of a network, and um, if you have additional properties on your network, like it's, it's bound a tree with, for example, or it's like a sparse graph, or it's a tree structure, or something like this, uh, these problems can be overcome. So currently we're exploring what kind of graphs allow us polynomial time algorithms, or even optimal algorithms, um, to, to schedule these updates. Even a more fundamental question, of course, is can I update it without this waypoint enforcement, if I can uh, simply enforce the, the loop freedom, and it's easy, relatively easy to see that you can always update the network in a consistent way in n rounds because you can simply start at the destination and then from the destination you can walk backward, it takes n rounds, you can make a consistent update. Um, however, it turns out that um, quite simple problem instances as well, they become NP-hard. For example, if you have a free round, a network update instance that could be solved in principle in free rounds, um, it's actually NP-hard to find this schedule that, that um, uh, upstates this, this, this network in actually three rounds. I will show you just an example um, for two rounds, um, how this can be done in polynomial time, and it's actually very easy, because um, in a two-round schedule, you can see that in the very first round, 
it's um, always safe to, to update all the forwarding edges because the forwarding edges are the only edges that you can actually update in the first round and never introduce a loop. And uh, the problem is somewhat symmetric because when you go from the old policy and find an update schedule to the new policy, and this schedule, if you read it backward, it's also kind of a legal schedule com from going from the new policy backward to the old policy. So in this sense, you can update in the first round the forwarding edges from the old policy to the new policy, and you can update the forwarding edges reading backward the schedule from the new policy to the old policy. And you basically can see that in this case, you can really compute the two round uh, update schedule in any case if it exists in, in polynomial time, almost linear time. So, um, so basically what we know in this topic so far um, is that the problem it generates NP-hard with the waypoint enforcement for two rounds, we can always update it in polynomial time. For three rounds, it's becoming NP-hard. If the graph structure has certain properties like bounded three with, then the problem again can be, um, is actually tractable. Um, and so this is one property that we focus on, loop freedom and waypoint enforcement. And, and later in, the, I think, the next talk, uh, there will be another property that we will consider. It's about congestion freedom. How can I update the network without transiently oversubscribing the links uh, of the update. An aspect that we have ignored in this model so far. Okay, good, any questions? So, I briefly saw something where it says some, something about the log end policy. Yes, so we, during our study we realized that there are two notions of loop freedom. So one is the topological loop freedom that I explained to you, but it turns out that if you don't care about the the topological loops, but you say I'm only caring not to introduce loop on the path from source to from the source S to the destination T, then um, you can actually always find an update schedule of at most a logarithmic number of rounds. So this was kind of conservative, uh, what we did here. Of course, if you do it along the flow only, then there may still be some packets left on the remaining links that may quickly go into a loop, but it's just a constant number and maybe you don't care so much about those. And then we found that with this notion of loop freedom, you can actually always do a log n round update. And we believe it's kind of optimal. So we did mixed integer programming, and we see that it really grows over time, the number of rounds that you need in the worst case. But whether it's a logarithm or no, that we don't know. Yes, Ratul? It always seems awesome. Like, I, I think I gave up on this line of work. <laughs> <laughs> I'm following the question. Like, uh, is, is all this worth it? Like, it seems, all this seems very, very intricate, right? Part, part of the, Part of the rationale for a move towards SDN was to try to simplify things, right? And and now it seems like you know we're just taking complexity and bringing it back. So I think my question to you is like, <laughs> yeah, is it is it worth it? I, I really like that you wrote this paper because I think it's a really, really interesting problem. That's why I also it here, so don't... Uh, but my, my question is, I, I, I made this argument with the tagging. I think you didn't do this in, in your paper. I really think, okay. Tagging, why should I do tagging? It, I don't think it's a very uh, pro unproblematic solution, right? Because where do they do the tagging? I don't quite know uh, where shall I add this, this additional... No, I think I'm asking maybe a larger question. Mechanisms aside, right? Like, you know, I, I think we need to realize, like, what consistency properties are needed by the network, should be provided by the network. And I, I think basically, looking at end-to-end -end principles or something like that in this space versus asking the network to do so much that is so complex or looks so complex. Right, right, right. So I'm actually exploring some of these uh, consistency properties. It's a very good question that I actually hope a little bit to find here. So what are, I see that this loop freedom is kind of fundamental, it's kind of interesting. Uh, it's also interesting to work on it, but I also get, of course, this comment all the time. I mean, what do I care about this intermediate uh, packets that quickly loop, right? I mean, what is really... Yes, Nate? So, so I also, well, I guess I've kept one foot in this line of research. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I would be careful not to lump together technical depth or technical, technical uh, I don't know, the kind of understanding that things can reveal here by sort of, you know, what are some of the fundamental trade-offs between different kinds of properties and complexity of finding you know, schedules or mechanisms and so on with complexity. The, the mechanism here is very simple still, right? It's just picking orderings to update devices. Um, so it's not that it's not that that's becoming somehow broke. Um, there's some intrinsic <coughs> problem. 
I think it's justified cases where you want strong properties like isolation, for example, if you want the right freedom. And these are, I think, really good things to want. And I think, uh, I don't think just because the map is a little bit hard, we should like, give up on this. <laughs>